Hey, this is John. Welcome back to Modern Old School Developer. So we've hit a milestone of sorts, a 1.0 release. The application is now every bit as functional as the demo that I showed off in the beginning, if not more so. But I have added several commits between the last episode and this one, and I thought a few of them should be highlighted. Most of them is just code cleanup, renaming things, and adding some consistency in error codes, things like that. But a few of them I thought were worth highlighting. So let's go take a look at a few things that I changed. So there is this where we handle attempts to remove invalid properties. Uh, I didn't fix that you could remove uh, actors or categories from movie that didn't have them on there. So that's now being handled gracefully. The fast API thing I think is really nice because if we go look at the difference between the fast API docs for the demo app and the one for our new app, you can see that they look quite a bit different. We've got all of our endpoints separated by the tag here. So I've tagged all the endpoints and that categorizes your different types of endpoints, which is really nice. We also have a title a version, a description, a GitHub link, and a license link. And this is all very easy to add in FastAPI, which is one of the reasons I absolutely love FastAPI. It's so easy to add these things. I've got the title here, the description here, which you can write in Markdown. It's perfect. Version, license information, and then a few extra things in our endpoints to talk about the response description the summary and the tags are what separate the endpoints. So if you don't leave a tag, it puts it in the default, which is where the Tello endpoint ended up, but all the tags end up in the same section, which is very nice. All right, so removing unnecessary database refreshes. So I didn't quite understand this and kind of copied it from the fast API uh, documentation, but all of these refreshes that we're doing were unnecessary. The commit will automatically expire your cache. The commit is the end of a session. Every time a session ends, the database cache is expired and anything that got changed will be refreshed the next time you try to access it. So that is a nice feature and we didn't need to do any of these database refreshes. So I've taken them all out. All right, cleaning up the link updates. A couple of episodes ago, I had a bunch of code in here, this right here, where we updated the links for studios and series. Some of that became unnecessary once I fixed the rename function. So inside rename movie file, we are updating our links, but we didn't have a way at the time to specify whether the series, studio, actor, or categories had changed. So it wasn't able to fix the links when those things changed. But once we fixed that function, it was able to. So if you use the rename movie file, the only time you need to update a link manually is when you are in a category, which never has a, a file name get renamed at all, or when you are removing a link. Because if you're removing a link, that property will no longer be on your movie and it won't be um, iterated over in rename movie file. So I did go ahead and change that. All right, well, that covers most of the changes. So why don't we take a look at the demo application and see how it compares to the version we have now. All right, so here's the demo application I showed off at the very beginning and more or less, it looks pretty similar to our new application. There's a difference in the buttons, difference in some of the uh, font weights and sizing and yada yada, and there's no giant gap in the categories, which you know I didn't know it was there until I started playing with it, but uh, more or less, it's the same. Um, when we first load this page, we don't have any selection, but we do disable the button, so it's not so bad, but it could be better. It would be nice if the first one was highlighted automatically, which we do in the new application, so that's nice. 
So what about um, in the admin page? Well, uh, there's no way to update any of these things or delete them, and there's no import button. So if I want to import movies, I have to go to the back end. All right, so I'll go to the back end and import some new movies. And I go back over here, and they're not here. We have to hit refresh. There's no integration with that, which is a minor nitpick, but it is a better user experience when the things are tied together better. So it's nice that the movie manager doesn't have that problem and it solves it with the import button. So that's nice. Um, the other thing that's a big problem here is there's no status when you update something. So if I add an actor, like if I add Chris Hemsworth here, it says nothing over here. Now I added Chris Hemsworth, but um, I didn't have any other information. And when we imported this file, we just have this big file name. We don't actually know what actors are on here. In fact, I'm not clear what happened at all here. We're getting adding Chris Hemsworth. So if I remove him, oh, he's on there again. So that's why he's on there again. So a lot of minor things that have been polished in our new application. So what am I saying? This one's completely better than this one? In most ways, yes. But in a few ways, it is not. I don't know if you saw this, but watch carefully on the clips when I add an actor. Ah, it was reflected immediately. Yes, we have immediate reflection of changes when we make a change anywhere in here. So if I say, and fair to remember, I update, it alphabetizes and goes to the right place. At least it's supposed to alphabetize it actually doesn't because if I rename the Dark Knight to be uh, the Dark Knight, you'll see it is below and a fair to remember. We are not doing that thing I did with the sort name. So again, minor things. But it does reflect changes immediately, which is very nice. And one more thing that's very subtle, it'll be hard to see, but when I flip back and forth, we are not refreshing the database. This has been cached which means we don't get new things by flipping back and forth. That's why when I imported the new movies, it didn't reload them. It had no way to know that there were new movies. Now it would have eventually if we'd waited some time, but it won't do it by default because there's no integration there. So that's something we'll be able to do in our new application. But pay close attention to the studio and series when I flip back and forth. Did you see it? The loading. It is loading from the database in the back end every single time we flip back and forth. And that is the only time anything in this list, this list, or this list will ever change. If you go up to the property, you have to go back and forth. Now, you would already, so not a big deal for those things, but we don't need to reload everything every time we go back and forth, but we are. And it's a little bit annoying and that load will get slower the longer your list grows. So with just these 15 movies or so, not a big deal. If you had a hundred in here, you would notice that load time and it would be very annoying when you're flipping back and forth. This is supposed to appear to be a one page application. In other words, I'm not supposed to have to load every time I change something, but we are. So that's a problem that we're going to start solving with Redux Toolkit and Redux Toolkit Query. All right, so that's where I want to go next in this video. I want to start working on refactoring our application to use Redux Toolkit and Redux Toolkit Query. So what exactly are those? Well, they're both part of Redux, and Redux is the most popular state management library for React. We've seen that React does have built-in ways to manage state, but at a certain point in your application, those may fall short for different reasons. So use state is not very flexible, but the use context and use reducer hooks were added to make it easier to pass down state and to update multiple pieces of state at once. And that is helpful, but they still have a lot of render overhead that you might not want in a bigger application. And there's also no built-in way with React to manage asynchronous state, which is what 
Redux Toolkit query does. Redux already had methods for handling asynchronous state, but now they're built on top of Redux Toolkit, which makes them much easier to use. So we're gonna use both of those things to make things better in our application. We'll be able to see changes reflected automatically whenever we make them, and we won't have this problem of reloading our data every time we flip back and forth. So that's some of the things we'll be solving with Redux Toolkit and Redux Toolkit Query. Before we go on, I wanted to mention that there are other state management libraries for React. I ended up choosing Redux for several reasons. First, Redux can do both sync and async state management. Most libraries do one or the other. Now, by itself, I would not have picked Redux. Redux is notoriously difficult to use. And without Redux Toolkit, I would never have selected Redux. But Redux Toolkit is addressing those usability concerns, and it's much easier to use than it was in the past. And now that there's Redux Toolkit Query for the async part, it's actually pretty easy to use, and I can just use one library, which I kind of like. Additionally, I haven't seen a lot of tutorials out there on Redux Toolkit and Redux Toolkit Query. So I wanted to highlight that in this video so that there's more content out there. Now, I originally was going to use React Query, and that would have been fine. In fact, I like React Query. It's very nice. I actually like it a little bit better than Redux Toolkit Query. But for the reasons I outlined, I didn't end up going with that even though I think it's a great library. All right, so that's a little bit about why I picked Redux. All right, let's start by installing our Redux Toolkit library. So let's say npm install at redux.js slash toolkit. And there are some packages that integrate with React to help us. So we're gonna install React Redux and at types slash React Redux. All right, once that's installed, Let's go make some new files. Let's go into our state folder in our front end, and let's make one called store.ts. This is gonna be our Redux store. This is where all of our state and reducers will live in Redux. So the first thing I wanna do is I want to import configure store from Redux.js toolkit. And we're gonna use that to build our store. So we'll say export const store equals configure store. The function requires an object and the object requires a reducer parameter. And we're gonna put that as a blank object for now, but we'll add some reducers in a minute. Next, I want to make some types, which will help us work with TypeScript and Redux Toolkit. So let's export type. This type's gonna be called root state and it's gonna be a return type which is a type of store.getState. And then we'll have another type. We're gonna call this app dispatch. And it is type of store.dispatch. All right, so this is a little abstract by right now, but you'll see how it will be helpful in a minute. Let's go ahead and save this, and let's make another function over here. I'm gonna call that hooks.ts. And in this file, we're gonna import a few things from React Redux. So React Redux adds hooks we can use with React when we're using Redux, because Redux is actually not dependent on React. So there's a plugin for React to make it easier to use with functional components. So I'm gonna start by importing a few things from there. I want the type use selector hook, I want the use dispatch, and I want the use selector. All right. Next, I want to import those types I made from our store. So I want to import root state, and I also want app dispatch. All right, and we're going to use those to make custom hooks, which will work better with TypeScript for us. So let's export our new hooks. We'll export const use app dispatch, and this is similar to the dispatch we got from our state context, but the dispatch and the state is combined in Redux. It's not being provided by a context. All right, let's say that is a function and we use the use dispatch hook with type app dispatch. 
And there we go. So we have now typed the hook from React Redux for our actual state. Now we will export our use app selector. And this is going to be a typed use selector hook of root state. And that's going to be use selector. All right, so there are our two hooks we're going to use to access our Redux state. The next thing we need to do is make a provider component and provide our state to the application. Since Redux is meant to be used globally, we provide it to the entire application. So we'll put it in app.tsx. It's similar to our state context provider. So let's put it somewhere in here. Let's say we're going to import provider from React Redux. All right. And I also want to import store from state store. All right, and we'll go right up here and we will say provider store equals store and we'll get that and then we'll close that over here. All right, so now we're providing our state to our entire application. When I was looking back over the demo application, I remember that I didn't make as heavy use of Formic in that application as I did in this one. In fact, almost all of our state is being managed by Formic in this application. The only things that aren't are our async state. But there are a few places where Formic is not helping us so much. Those multi-select boxes are causing a lot of problems with Firefox, and we've had a lot of trouble throughout building the application we've had to work around. So why don't we simply migrate that out of Formic and into Redux? So to add some state to Redux, we need to create what's called a slice. A slice is a piece of state information we want to control with Redux. And it's also the manner in how we update that state. So let's see how that's done. Let's go into state and we're gonna make an actor selector slice.ts. So what do we use in this actor selector slice? Well, I want to start out by importing some functions from Redux Toolkit. We want to get create slice, and we also want to get payload action. Then we need to make the initial state for this slice of our state. So we're going to say const initial state equals an object. We're going to have our available ID, which will be zero, and our selected ID, which will be zero as well. We should probably type this too. So let's say interface actor selector slice type. And that's going to be available, which is a number, and selected ID, which is a number. Let's put ID on there too. And we'll type this as well. So this is an actor selector slice type. All right, so that's all good. And now we then we can create our slice. So I'm going to say const slice equals create slice, and it takes an object. The name is going to be important in a minute, but I'm just going to call it actor selector. And then we'll have initial state, which is our initial state. And we're going to have some reducers. And our reducers are the functions we'll use to make changes to our state. So I usually like to include a reset state. So we'll say reset and we'll just return initial state. So you can do a couple things in a reducer. If you return state, you need to return the entire state. So we're just sending back the initial state and that will be a reset action. All right, we can do um, set available ID, and that's going to be a function which takes a state and it takes an action. The action is going to be a payload action of type number. This is how our action will be typed. So the action dot payload is going to be of type number. It's going to be an arrow function, and all we have to say is state dot available ID equals action dot payload. It's pretty similar to when we were using our use reducers, but notice we didn't have to spread our state. This is because Redux 
is using Emmer behind the scenes to make things that look like they're changing objects actually become immutable. So we're actually returning the change state. It just doesn't look like it because we don't have to do that. It's abstracted that complexity away from us. All right, other thing we'll do is set selected ID. Again, it takes the state and an action, which is a payload action of type number. And then we're gonna have the arrow function and we say state.selectedID equals action payload. All right, and that's pretty much all we have to do. So now we can export these reducers so that we can have our functions wherever we want that. So let's say we export const and we're gonna export reset, set available ID, and set selected ID. And that's all gonna be from slice.actions. We will also export as default slice.reducer. This is how we're going to import our reducer into our state. So now that we've made our slice, how do we attach it to our store? Well, back in store.ts, we have to attach it as a reducer. So we're gonna say that our actor selector is actually an actor selector slice, which will be imported from there automatically. So there we go, there's our slice and there's our reducer. So we now have this as part of our state. All right, so now that we have our first slice, how do we actually make use of that in our component? Well, let's go over to actor selector and let's see how that works. So the use context hook provided us with both the state and the dispatcher, but in Redux, those are separate hooks. So to get our state values, we use the use app selector. So let's say const store equals use app selector and we need to decide what values we want because the benefit of Redux over use context is that we can subscribe to only particular parts of our state and that means we can trigger fewer re-renders, which is why you can have a global state but not cause re-renders every time you're updating parts of your state. So we need a function here. The function receives a state and we're going to return what we want. And what we want is the state.actor selector. That is all the state information from our actor selector slice. And we can destructure the parameters to get those individually. So let's say I want available ID and selected ID. And you can see the type completion works very well for that. So that's why we have the use app selector hook we made from state hooks. All right. To get our dispatch, we'll say const redux dispatch equals use app dispatch. Pretty simple for our dispatch. So let's scroll down to our select component and let's change it from being managed by Formic to being managed by Redux. So we needed this name parameter for Formic, but we don't need that for Redux. All right, the on change handler is when we're going to update our value. So why don't we go ahead and do that? So we'll get a function that takes an event, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna say Redux Dispatch, and we need to give it an action. So what is an action? An action is any of these functions we define as reducers on our slice. Those are our actions. And this is our action payload. So all we have to do is say, I want the set available ID action and give it the value, which is the payload, which is a number type. So let's give it um, e.target.value. And there we go, we have updated our value in Redux. Okay, so let's come down here and replace these things here. So do we have an actor ID? Well, we can check that by simply saying available ID. We got that earlier in our function. So if we do, we're simply going to call on update actor, but we're not gonna use formic values anymore. We're gonna use available ID. But formic was using a string property. We're using a number property. I may change that, but we'll just convert to a string for now. There we go, on update actor is looking good now. And we can do the exact same thing over here 
and get rid of these two values. There we go. We have fixed this from being managed by Formic to being managed by uh, Redux. So let's take a look and make sure things still work. So let's go see if anything crashed. Nope, I don't see anything crashed. That looks like it's okay. So let's hit refresh. All right. So I can select actors. That seems to work just fine. So why don't I do this? Why don't we say I add Carrie Fisher to this movie? Well, I was able to do that just easy. What about Chadwick Boseman? I'll double click. Yep, that works just fine. Now, do we have those values on there? How do we check for that? Well, there's actually a um, some developer tools we can use to look at that. So let's go into the Redux developer tools and we can see our state. So look at our state right now. We see that our actor available ID is nine. So Chadwick Boseman is probably actor nine. Now it's 10, 11, 12. If I add Daniel Radcliffe and go back into our thing here, you'll see we did actor 12. So yes, the state is working. And these Redux toolkits or this um, Redux developer tool is very nice to be able to visualize what's going on in your state. Another big bonus for Redux. All right, well, I think that's a good wrapping up point for today's episode. I hope that you have enjoyed it. I hope that Redux has become a little more usable with Redux, um, with Redux Toolkit and that everything is looking a little nicer for that. If you have enjoyed today's video, if it was helpful or useful or interesting in any way, please hit the like button and the subscribe button, and I will see you in the next episode where we will do more things with Redux, possibly some Redux Toolkit query stuff. I don't know. We'll see. I will see you then. Thanks for watching.